Hello there, thank you for clicking on this video. Your time is valuable, so we are super grateful that you are giving our little channel a chance. Any feedback is appreciated. Enjoy the story. Gulliver's Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World by Jonathan Swift Part 1 A Voyage to Lilliput Chapter 1 the author gives some account of himself and family. His first inducement to travel, he is shipwrecked and swim for his life, gets safe on a shore in the country of Lilliput, is made a prisoner and carried up the country. My father had a small state in Nottinghamshire. I was the third of five sons. He sent me to Emmanuel College in Cambridge at 14 years old, where I resided three years where applied myself close to my studies. But the charge of maintaining me, although I had a very scantly allowance, being too great for a narrow fortune, I was bound apprentice to Mr. James Bates, an eminent surgeon in London, with whom I continued four years. My father now and then sending me small sum of money. I laid them out in learning navigation, and other parts of the mathematics useful to those who intend to travel, as I always believed some time or other my fortune to be. When I left Mr. Bates, I went down to my father, where, by the assistance of him and my uncle John and some other relations, I got forty pounds and a promise of thirty pounds a year to maintain me at Leyden. There I studied physics two years and seven months, knowing would be useful in long voyages. Soon after my return to Leyden, I was recommended by my good master, Mr. Bates, to be surgeon to the shallow Captain Abraham Pennell, commander, with whom I continued three years and a half, making a voyage or two into Levant and some other parts. When I came back, I resolved to settle in London, to which Mr. Bates, my master, encouraged me and by him I was recommended to several patients. I took part of a small house in the old jewelry and being advised to alter my conditions, I married Miss Mary Borton, second daughter of Mr. Edmund Borton, hosier, in Newgate Street, with whom I received £400 for a portion. But my good master Bates dying in two years after, and I having few friends, my business began to fail, for my consciousness would not suffer me to imitate the bad practice of too many among my brethren. Having therefore consulted with my wife and some of my acquaintances, I determined to go again to sea. I was surgeon successively in two ships, and made several voyages for six years to the eastern and western Indies, by which I got some addition to my fortune. My hours of leisure I spent reading the best authors, ancient and modern, being always provided with a good number of books, and when I was ashore, in observing the manners and disposition of the people, as well as learning their language, wherein I had great facility by the strength of my memory. The last of these voyages, not proving very fortunate, I grew weary of the sea and intended to stay at home with my wife and family. I removed from the old jewelry to Fetter Lane, and from thence to Wiping, hoping to get business among the sailors, but it would not turn to account. After three years' expectation that the thing would mend, I accepted an adventurous offer from Captain William Pratchard, master of the Antelope, who was making a voyage to the South Sea. We set sail from Bristol, May 4th, 1699 and our voyage was at first very prosperous. It would not be proper, for some reason, to travel the readers with the particulars of our adventures in those seas, let it suffer to inform, in that in our passage from thence to the Eastern Indies, we were driven by a violent storm to the northwest to Dan Damon's land. By an observation, we found ourselves in the latitude of 30 degrees 2 minutes south, Twelve of our crew were dead by immoderate labor and ill food. The rest were in very weak condition. On the 5th of November, which was the beginning of the summer in those parts, the weather being very hazy, the seamen spied the rock with half a cable length of the ship, 
but the wind was so strong that we were driven directly upon it and immediately split six of the crew of whom i was one having let down the boat into the sea made a shift to get clear of the ship and the rock we rode by my computation about three legs till we were able to work no longer being already spent with labor while we were in the ship we therefore trusted ourselves to the mercy of the waves in about half an hour the boat was overset by a sudden flurry from the north what became of my companions in the boat as well as of those who escaped on the rock or were left in the vessel i cannot tell but concluded they were all lost for my own part i swam as fortune directed me and i was pushed towards by wind and tide i often let my legs drop and could feel no bottom but when i was almost gone and able to struggle no longer i found myself with my depth and by this time the storm was much abated the declivity was so small that i walked near a mile before i get to the shore which i conjured was about eight o'clock in the evening and then advanced forwards near half of mile but could not discover any sign of houses or inhabitants at least i was in a so weak a condition that i did not observe them i was extremely tired and the heat of the weather and about half pint of brandy that i drank as i left the ship i found myself inclined to sleep i lay down on the grass which was very short and soft where i slept sounder than i ever remember to have done in my life and as i reckon about nine hours for when i awaked it was just daylight i attempted to rise but it was not able to steer for i happened to lie on my back i found my arms and legs were strongly fastened on each side of the ground and my hair which was long tied down in the same manner i likewise felt several slender ligatures across my body from my armpits to my tights i could only look upwards the sun began to grow hot and the light offended my eyes i heard a confused noise about me but in the posture i lay could see nothing except the sky in a little time i felt something alive moving on my leg which advancing gently forward over my breast came almost up to my chin when bending my eyes downwards as much as i could i perceived it to be a human creature not six inches high with a bow and arrow in his hands and a quiver in his back in the meantime i felt at least forty more of the same kind as i conjured following the first i was in the utmost astonishment and roared so loud that they all ran back in fright and some of them as i was afterwards told were hurt with the fall they got by leaping from my sides upon the ground however they soon returned and one of them who ventured so far as to get full sight of my face lifted up his hands and eyes by way of admiration cried out in a shrill but distinct voice hey can they go the others repeated the same words several times but then i knew not what they meant i lay all this while as the readers may believe in great uneasiness at length struggling to get loose i had the fortune to break the strings and wrench out the pegs that fastened my left arm to the ground for by lifting up to my face i discovered the methods they had taken to bind me and at the same time with a violent pull which gave me excessive pain i little loosened the strings that tied down my hair on the left side so that i was just able to turn my head about two inches but the creatures ran off a second time before i could seize them whereupon there was a great shout in a very shrill accent and after a ceased i heard one of them crying aloud dog upon it when in an instant i fell above hundred arrows discharging on my left hand which prickled me like so many needles and besides they shot another flight into the air as we do bombs in europe whereof many i suppose fell on my body though i felt them not and some on my face which i immediately covered with my left hand when this shower of arrow was over i felt a groaning with grief and pain 
and then shriving again to get loose, they discharge another volley larger than the first, and some of them attempt with spears to stick me in the sides, but my good luck I had on a buff jacket which they could not pierce. I thought it was most prudent method to lie still, and my design was to continue till night, when, my left hand being already loose, I could easily free myself. And as for the inhabitants, I had reason to believe I might be a match for the greatest army they could bring against me, if they were all of the same size with him that I saw. But fortune disposed otherwise of me. When the people observed I was quiet, they discharged no more arrows, but by the noise I heard I knew their number increased, and about four yards from me, over against my right ear, I heard a knocking for about an hour, like that of people working. When turning my head that way, as well as the pecks and stings would permit me, I saw a stage erected about a foot and a half from the ground, capable of holding four of the inhabitants, with two or three ladders to mount it. From hence one of them, who seemed to be a person of quality, made me a long speech, whereof I understood not one syllable. But I should have mentioned that before the principal person began his oration, he cried out three times, Largo de Husan! These words and the former were afterward repeated and explained to me whereupon immediately about fifty of the inhabitants came cut the strings that fastened the left side of my head which gave me the liberty of turning it to the right and observing the person and gesture of him that was to speak he appeared to be of middle age and taller than any of the other three who attended him whereof one was a page that held up his train and it seemed to be somewhat longer than my middle finger then the other two stood one on each side to support him he acted every part of an orator and i could observe many periods of threatenings and other of promises pity and kindness i answered in few words but in the most submissive manner lifting up my left hand and both my eyes to the sun as calling him of witness and being almost famished with hunger have I not eaten a morse of some hours before I left the ship? I found the demands of nature so strong upon me that I could not forbear showing my impatience, perhaps against the strict rules of decency, by putting my finger frequently to my mouth to sight that I want food. The Hurgu, for so they call a great lord, as I afterwards learned, understood me very well. He descended from the stage and commanded that several ladders should be applied to my sides, on which above a hundred of the inhabitants mounted and walked towards my mount, leading with baskets full of meat, which had been proven and sent traitor by the king's order upon the first intelligence he received of me. I observed there was the flesh of several animals, but could not distinguish them by the taste. There were shoulders, legs, or loins shaped like those of muttons, and very well dressed, but smaller than the wings of a lark. I ate them by two or three of mouthful, and took three loaves at a time, about bigness of musket bullets. They supplied me as fast as they could, showing a thousand marks of wonder and astonishment at my bulk and appetite. Then I made another sign, that I wanted to drink. They found by my eating that small quantity should not suffice me, and begun the most ingenious work. They slung up with a great dexterity one of their largest hawk's heads, then rolled it towards my hand and beat out the top. I drank it off at a draw, which I might well do, for it did not hold half a pint, and tasted like small wine of burgundy, but much more delicious. They brought me a second hawk hat, which I drank in the same manner, and made sign for more, but they had none to give me. When I had performed these wonders, they shouted for joy, and danced upon my breast, repeating several times as they did the first, Hecking on the goo! They made me a sign that I should throw down the two hawk hats, but first warning the people below to stand out of the way, crying aloud, Borach, Mevolak! and when they saw the vessels in the air there was an universal shout of hekahau de goo 
I confess, I was often tempted, while they were passing backwards and forwards on my body, to seize forty or fifty of the first that I came in my reach and dash them against the ground. But the remembrance of what I had felt, which probably might not be the worst they could do, and the promise of honor I made them, for so I interrupted my submissive behavior, soon drove out these imaginations. Besides, I now consider myself as bound by the law of hospitality to people who had treated me with so much expense and magnificence. However, in my thoughts, I could not sufficient wonder of the interprudity of these diminutive mortals who durst venture to mount and walk upon my body while one of my hands was at liberty without trembling at the very sight of so prodigious a creature as I must appear to them. After some time, when they observed that I made no more demand for meat, there appeared before me a person of high rank from his imperial majesty. His Excellency, having mounted on the small of my right leg, advanced forwards up to my face with about a dozen of his retune, and produced his credentials under signet royal, which he applied close to my eye, spoken about ten minutes without any sign of anger, but with a kind of determined resolution, often pointing forwards, which, as afterwards found, was towards the capital city, about half a mile distant, whether it was agreed by his majesty in council that I must be conveyed. I answered in few words, but to no purpose, and made my sign with my hand that was loose, putting it to the other, but over his excellency head for fear of hurting him or his train and then to my own head and body, to signify that I desire my liberty. It appeared that he understood me well enough, for he shook his head by way of disapprobation, and held his hand in a position to show that I must be carried as a prisoner. However, he made other sign to let me understand that I should have meat and drink enough, a very good treatment. Whereupon I was more taught to break my bonds, but again, when I felt the smart of their arrows upon my face and hands, which were all in the blusters, and many of the darts still stuck in them, and observing likewise that the number of my enemy increased, I gave tokens to let them know that they might do with me what they please. Upon this, the Urgu and the train withdraw with much civility and cheerful countenance. Soon after, I heard a general shout with frequent repetition of the word Pipum Selam, and I felt great number of people on my left side relaxing the court in such a degree that I was able to turn upon my right, and to easy myself with making water, which I very plainfully did to the greatest astonishment of the people, who, conjuncturing by my motion what I was going to do, immediately opened the right and left on the side, to avoid the torrent which fell with such noise and violence from me. But before this they had dabbed my face and bought my hands with sort of ointment, very pleasant to smell, which in a few minutes removed all the small of their arrows. These circumstances added to the refreshment I had received by their victuals and drink, which were very nourishing, disposed me to sleep. I slept about eight hours, as I was afterwards assured, and it was no wonder, for the physicians, by the emperor order, had mingled a sleepy portion in the hog head of wine. It seems that upon the first moment I was discovered sleeping on the ground after my landing, the imperial had early notice of it by an express, and determined in council that I should be tied in manners I have related, which was done in the night while I slept. Plenty of meat and drink should be sent to me, and a machine prepared to carry me to the capital city. This resolution, perhaps, may appear very bold and dangerous, and I am confident would not be immediate by any prince in Europe in the likewise occasion. However, in my opinion, it was extremely prudent, as well as generous, for supposing these people had endeavored to kill me with their spears and arrows while I was asleep. I should certainly have awakened with the first sense of smart, which might so far have roused my rage and strength. 
as to have enabled me to break the strings wherewith I was tied, after which, as they were not able to make resistance, so they could expect no mercy. These people are most excellent mathematicians and arrive to a great perfection in mechanics by the countenance and encouragement of the imperial, who is renowned patron of learning. This prince has several machines fixed on wheels for the carriage of three and other great weights. He often builds his largest men of war, whereof some are nine feet long in the woods where the timber grows, and has them carried on these engines three or four hundred yards to the sea. Five hundred carpenters and engineers were immediately set at work to prepare the greatest engine they had. It was a frame of wood risen three inches from the ground, above seven feet long and four wide, moving upon twenty-two wheels. The shout I heard was upon the arrival of this engine, which it seemed set out in four hours after my landing. It was brought parallel to me as I lay, but in principle difficulty was to raise and place me in the vehicle. Eight poles, each of one foot high, were erected for this purpose and very strong cords of the bigness of packrit were fastened by hooks to many bandages, which the workmen had girt around my neck, my hands, my body, and my legs. Nine hundred of the strongest men were employed to draw up these cords by many pulls fastened on the poles, and thus, in less than three hours, I was raised and slug into the engine, and there tied fast. All this I was taught, for, while the operation was performing, I was laying in a profound sleep by the force of the sporiferous medicine infused into the liquor. Fifteen hundred of the imperial largest horses, each about four inches and a half high, were employed to draw me towards the metropolis, which, as I said, was half a mile distant. About four hours after we began our journey, I awake by a very ridiculous accident, for the carriage, being stopped a while to adjust something that was out of order, two or three of the young natives had the curiosity to see how I look when I was asleep. They clumped up into the engine, and advancing very softly to my face, one of them, an officer in the guards, put the sharp end of his half-pike a good way up into my left nostril which tickled my nose like a straw and made me sneeze violently. Whereupon they stole off unperceived, and it was three weeks before I knew the cause of my waking so suddenly. We made a long march the remaining part of the day, and rested at night with five hundred guards at each side of me, half with torches and half with bows and arrows, ready to shoot me if I could offer a steer. The next morning, at sunrise, we continue our march and arrive with two hundred yards of the great city about noon. The emperor and all his court came out to meet us, but his great officer would be no means suffer his majesty to endanger his person by mounting on my body. At the place where the carriage stopped, there stood an ancient temple, esteemed to be the largest in the whole kingdom which, having been polluted some years before by an ancient murder, was, according to the zeal of these people, looked upon as profane, and therefore had been applied to common use, and all the ornament and furniture carried away. In this edifice it was determined I should lodge. The great gate fronting to the north was about four feet high and almost two feet wide, throughout which I could easily creep, on each side of the gate was a small window, not above six inches from the ground. Into that, on the left side, the king's smith conveyed fourscore and eleven chains, like those that hung to the lady's watch in Europe, and almost as large, which were locked to my left leg with six and thirty odd locks. Over against this temple, on the other side on the great highway, at twenty feet distance, there was a turret at least five feet high. Here the emperor ascended, with many principal lords of his court, to have an opportunity of viewing me, as I was told, for I could not see them. 
it was reckoned that above a hundred thousand inhabited came out of the town upon the same errand and in spite of my guards i believe there could not be of fewer than ten thousand at several times who mounted by my body by the help of ladders but a proclamation was soon issued to forbid it upon a pain of death when the workmen found it was impossible for me to break loose they cut all the strings that bound me whereupon i rose up with as melancholy a deposition as ever i had in my life but the noise and astonishment of these people at seeing me graze and walk are not to be expressed the chain that held my left leg was about two yards long and gave me not only a liberty of walking backwards and forwards in a semicircle but being fixed with four inches of the gate allowed me to creep in and lay at my full length in the temple thank you for listening please subscribe and if you like it please leave a comment bye for now